Um, good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, can I ask everyone present to switch off their mobile phones and other electronic equipment uh, as they affect the broadcasting system? Some committee members will refer to uh, tablets during the meeting. Uh, that's because we provide uh, the papers in digital format. Uh, agenda item one uh, is an inquiry into flexibility and autonomy of local government. We have one panel giving evidence this morning. I'd like to welcome the Minister, Derek Mackay, uh, Minister for Local Government and Planning, and Robin Haynes uh, from the Scottish Government's Local Government Division. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Minister, would you like to make any opening remarks? Good morning. Thank you, convener. I'm very grateful for the committee inviting me to give further evidence on behalf of the Scottish Government further to my letter and submission of the 20th of March, which sets out the Government's thinking and policy direction in relation to the inquiry's remit and aims. The forthcoming referendum and the prospect of democratic renewal that it brings is demonstrating that the people of Scotland do have a real interest in local decision making and the determination of public service provision. This committee's inquiry has an important part to play as we consider which powers and responsibilities might be best determined at local level and which might more naturally reside with the Scottish Government and Parliament. The default position of the Scottish Government is described by the First Minister's Lerwick Declaration in which he confirmed our commitment to subsidiarity and local decision-making. However, we must recognise that we're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. There are established structures in place and public services they deliver are very much the bedrock of our society. It, there is most certainly at this time a constitutional opportunity, and in this regard, the three island councils that joined forces to establish the Our Islands Our Future campaign have been the first to engage as you know, we've been working closely with the leaders and senior officials from Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles Councils, with the final meeting of the Islands Area Ministerial Working Group taking place in Kirkwall last week. The Island Councils came with a clear aspiration of what additional powers they wanted. Together, we have given careful consideration and thought to which level of government might be most suitable for a particular responsibility, given the potential risks and benefits. The Scottish Government considered such things as whether, it would, uh, whether any such measure would empower um, local communities rather than simply being a transfer of responsibility between public bodies, command a high level of public support within the community, lead to improvements in the quality of services, represent value for money and not impose costs on other communities, or enable Scottish ministers and councils to fulfil their duties of accountability. The conclusion of this work will be announced by the First Minister when the prospectus for empowering our island communities is launched. Working with our islands, our future campaign and formulating a package of increased autonomy for island communities to ensure that Scotland's islands can address the challenges they face, they face and seize the opportunities for, for economic growth has been very important. It will relate wholly to Orkney, Shetland and the West Isles, but my discussions with Highland, Argyll and Butte and North Ayrshire Councils show that nearly all of the measures will apply to the other island areas in Scotland. Although this first piece of work fulfilling our commitment to subsidiarity relates to Scotland's 93 inhabited islands, the Lerwick Declaration applies equally to all other parts of Scotland. For example, cities and the regions play a central role in driving economic growth. The Scottish Government is committing to working individually and collectively with Scotland's cities to optimise that uh, growth for the benefit of the whole of Scotland. I could go on about the, the approach we're taking in town centres uh, as well. I believe the approach we've taken in the island areas uh, working group is, is the right one. As the Government's evidence to this inquiry notes, the optimal balance between central and local responsibilities must take account of not just what is required in a, an area, but what taxpayers, voters and the users of public services expect to receive. Of course, the ability of local communities to determine the services they want depends on the capacity and the finances to deliver those services. This is why we've protected local government budgets as best we can from the recent overall reductions to public spending and uh, eliminating, almost eliminating, ring fencing of budgets so as to provide local government with greater autonomy in how they spend their budgets. One aspect of the committee's present inquiry, which also relates to your report from the 2012 local government elections, connects directly with the, the government's present consultation on Scotland's electoral future. 
as primarily seeks views on how we can improve the quality of democracy in Scotland by encouraging wider engagement and participation in elections. Eminently, I'm looking forward to the introduction to Parliament of the Community Empowerment Bill, which, upon enactment, will help shift the balance of power more towards communities. It will give them new rights to have their voices heard in relation to the design and delivery of public services and the community planning process, and at their own initiative, it will make sure that their proposals to take over public sector assets are properly considered, amongst other areas. The Bill will also reinforce the Scottish Government's message that we expect all local authorities and other public bodies, uh, bodies to continue to support communities to become more empowered and to participate in the decisions made by those bodies. Those authorities, uh, which are already doing well, should not find the, the new Bill uh, onerous, but it will make others catch up to that best practice. Uh, in conclusion, Convener, uh, we're entering an exciting time for local democracy in Scotland. The opportunity we have created this constitutional moment and the potential transfer of all reserve powers to this Parliament creates a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to empower our communities as well. Democracy is first and foremost about people and communities, not parliaments, councils or governments, and a modernised democracy must have the delivery of improved local services that meet local needs at its core. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, the committee, or some members of the committee, have of course uh, embarked on a, a wee tour of Europe to look at some of the setups there in Germany, uh, Denmark, and Sweden. Um, and obviously, uh, local government there has a constitutional uh, and, a, a, and legislative protection um, and independence. Uh, how do you envisage um, seeing? Uh, local government's constitutional place uh, and what can be done to ensure that legislative protection that so many municipalities, local authorities have in other places? Uh, Kimber, I think that's uh, an absolutely key point. The UK, of course, doesn't have a written constitution and I know in that context the rights of local government um, cannot be enshrined in a constitution that doesn't exist in a UK term. But with the prospect of an independent Scotland and a written constitution, we could protect local government in such a, a constitution, and that's very much the uh, position of the Scottish government. You know, some would argue a bill in Parliament would suffice. No, it would not, because one bill supersedes another bill in terms of this place and this Parliament. But with this opportunity, we could uh, protect, we would propose to protect local government within a written constitution in an independent Scotland. Of course, we've set out how, we're, how we'll arrive at that, uh, at that uh, uh, final constitution, but we would absolutely propose local government have its place within that. Over and above that, compliance with the European Charter is important. Uh, UK is a signatory to that, therefore Scotland de facto is also one. And we are uh, happy, content with uh, the report that was received in terms of the monitoring of that European Committee, which showed that the partnership approach we take in Scotland is received very positively, and we would continue to apply the principles of the European Charter as it relates to local government. You, sir, as we have been taking evidence here um, from elected members, uh, we've heard from most folks um, that they would like to ensure that uh, local communities are more empowered than they currently are. Um, we've heard from people um, that there are, are impediments uh, to transferring resource and power uh, to local bodies, whether that be community councils or others. And yet, when we have uh, questioned them on what um, those impediments are, it's been very difficult to get an answer. Can I ask you if, if there are any legal impediments uh, for uh, further transfer down to community councils or, or whatever level it may be, um, would the government be uh, flexible in terms of, of looking at removing any legislative barriers uh, to allow local authorities to do so? We, uh, through a range of different methods, can empower <sighs> communities and, and as I've, I've highlighted, I think the Community Empowerment Bill will, will further assist with this. I mean, individual actions include uh, support for uh, community ownership service, the, the work we're doing with Cosland Improvement Service around supporting uh, community councils and the, and, and the work there, um, participatory budgeting. We don't propose to legislate for participatory 
uh, budgeting, but it's absolutely something we would encourage local people having an active say in how resources are spent. There's a national model and good practice and engagement as well. But your question is more than just about engagement and consultation. It's about participatory democracy. And that's why I want to improve on engagement and turnout in elections, as well as not just from one election to the next, but how public sector bodies engage day to day, week to week, month to month with communities. So we're absolutely supportive. And of course, good accountancy arrangements and governance and legislative arrangements need to ensure there's checks and balances and safeguards in place, of course. Uh, that said, uh, there is the power of well-being and this principle of subsidiarity about trying to take decision-making as close to the people um, as possible. So community councils I've referenced are, are important, but so are a number of other community anchor organisations. It might be the Housing Association, it might be the Development Trust, it might be the local you know, uh, mums and toddlers action group that want to deliver projects and be empowered to get on and do things. And that's why we have to be quite creative and not too rigid about how um, certain services and projects are delivered. So more work to come in participation of public services through the community um, empowerment bill. But yes is the answer to your question. We are more than happy to receive um, identification of what the, as you describe, impediments are to progress in this area, uh, because we sometimes hear there are barriers to progress that when we push it don't exist or may exist in people's minds of what they think they are. Matt said there's good reasons to have governance and, and accountability and finance structures to ensure that we're transparent around how public resources are used. And as another example of good practice, you may have local area committees and so on at a local level that can engage people in the day-to-day -day decisions uh, rather than the uh, traditional top-down approach. Hopefully that answers your question, convener. It does, Minister. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, when we were travelling around, we decided that different degree of flexibility would be welcome. We thought community councils up in the north they had different things like that. Do you think there's anything... Would you give them different powers, and how would you determine this different sort of flexibility? It's not just community councils. We rather focused on community councils at one point, but in fact there's all sorts of other things, and the Western Isles had different approaches, like you said, mothers and toddlers and planning committees and things like that. How would you empower them? Would you... Was there any way you'd try and do that? I think there's two, 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 two key points uh, uh, there that, that I would identify. First of all, around uh, community councils, and I go back to my comments that we're trying to create the right conditions for success for any local group to take forward their outcomes-focused agenda. What are the projects that deliver on the pillars of public service reform around prevention, integration, uh, great, great, better use of people and workforce, and improved performance? So in that sense, whatever the structure in the organisation, we want to create the right conditions for success. I don't propose a whole new review of the powers of community councils, but that said, we do propose to give them greater involvement in areas such as, for example, common good funds and the transparency and decision-making around assets there. So, so yes is the answer. We want to support that empowerment agenda to, to a range of our community organisations. Now, the second point around what is being described, I suppose, as differential devolution, maybe different local authorities or different areas having different powers may actually make sense because they seek different things. The cities are seeking a slightly different agenda from the towns who are seeking a slightly different agenda from the islands, clearly, who, even though they have things in common, also have, have differences. So the government is now embarking on that journey very positively. And I think the uh, islands work has been a trailblazer I think that the uh, COSLA Commission will help inform the next stages as well of you know, how local authorities and local partnerships organise themselves in this very exciting uh, democratic journey. So the government is very open-minded to approaches of what could be described as differential devolution, but not power and structural change for its own sake, but very much focused on outcomes and what will make the biggest difference in local people's lives. But, and not legislating particularly, that you just, I mean, in gen, not legislating in general. I mean, different communities That's with right. different legislation. That's right. I mean, That's some, the way I understand it. I, I, absolutely. So Good. in some places it's about capacity, resources, better alignment of priorities, an understanding of what considerations are taken into mind. It, but for some structural reform, if required at some point in the future, may well require legislation, but no such legislation is proposed at the moment. 
But I'm sure Mr Buchanan would be first to identify the opportunity that would come from Scotland being an independent nation with all the reserved powers coming to this place and this parliament. Careful, and then we could have... Careful. And then, careful. <laughs> at least entertain my concept that um, <laughs> with all those powers coming to this parliament, then we would have a further reinvigorated debate. So what would you pass to local authorities and to other local partners? Of course we'd have that debate. Things wouldn't stay the same in terms of what this parliament does and what local authorities and other public sector partners currently do. And there is a further opportunity to put that subsidiarity principle into practice. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. John Wilson, please. Maybe the minister could clarify what caused the commission because my understanding is the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy, while being chaired by the President of COSLA, is not, in fact, a COSLA Commission. Uh, maybe the Minister could clarify that when he answers the, my follow-up question. follow-up question is, Minister, running through the thread of the uh, Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy is the issue about the, the centralisation claims that have been made by not only Commission members but also other witnesses this committee has heard. Uh, what would be your reaction to that accusation that there has been a centralisation agenda in place by the Scottish Government? Minister? I think um, Mr Wilson wants me to clarify the position of uh, the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy, um, chaired by the COSLA President. So I'll leave it to you and, and to determine um, who you think um, leads it. I think, I think it's got pretty healthy membership um, and uh, it's not for me to comment on, on... I've given evidence at it as well. The, the Commission's enjoyed my presentation, I think, as well, um, as this uh, committee in terms of the government's point of view. Um, but we look forward to the Commission's uh, findings and proposals around the next stages. Of, of course we do. And I think they'll be complementary to this work. On the wider charge of um, a centralisation, you know, sometimes this argument comes down to one issue, the council tax freeze. And I find that a thoroughly depressing subject. If you think about the opportunity and the constitutional moment we have, the sense of empowerment for our communities, and when it comes down to that one issue, of course, you know, you'd expect me to say that the council tax freeze is, is fully funded and provided for. Local authorities can turn it down. If they choose, there's no legislative requirement to make them deliver it. All of that said, the power on the council tax freeze still rests with the local authority because we've compensated them to, to deliver it. Uh, I believe that it's a, it's a robust policy. But, but here's the issue. If this parliament uh, elects a government, as they have done with a manifesto, then this government has a right to deliver that, that manifesto. And sometimes it will be national commitments, such as a a council tax freeze on, or on a range of other policies. So we've got this democratic mandate to deliver national policies, just as local authorities have their democratic mandate to deliver those local policies as well. And sometimes between COSLA and government, it will be a matter of uh, negotiation. But the proof of the pudding's in the eating. In the financial freedom that local authorities have, ring fencing is down massively, I think, from memory, 2.7 billion down to about 200 million pounds. That's freed up a whole host of resources from something like a quarter of a local authority's budget um, to, to much greater autonomy financially now. Added to that, the other powers around power of well-being and the flexibility to deliver, I refute and reject the centralisation charge because we have a mandate to do certain things and we've done it. And I think that's democratically approved uh, and provided for and the flexibility that local authorities have give them the room to deliver their priorities um, as well. Now, there is, of course, is there not a dichotomy and a paradox around what some describe as a postcode lottery, where people in different parts of the country want the same standard of service. They want the same as the person in the next council area or the next street. So there is an issue about provision of national services and national standards and national requirement that can be delivered whilst also understanding the flexibility of local authorities. And the government's tried to, tried to support that provision of national standards and national commitments whilst empowering local authorities uh, to get on with it. But when we come back to this centralisation charge, the argument invariably returns to council tax freeze, and I hope I've given you the reason why. I don't think that that's a, a valid criticism of the government. Thank you, Convener. 
taking aside the council tax phrase that seems to be the bane of some local authorities in terms of and the, the allegation that's made about uh, the centralisation because of the, the council tax freeze. Uh, while, of course, annually welcomed by many local authorities, could the minister outline what additional powers, in terms of revenue raising, he could foresee uh, in a future Scotland that local authorities may have to deliver services uh, within their own communities? Minister? I'm sure Mr Wilson, whilst was giving me the opportunity to do so, doesn't expect me to propose uh, any further thinking on, on what uh, we may do in, in that situation. But the opportunity is this. The Parliament right now, of course, has powers over um, a degree of uh, the uh, income tax, as, as constrained as it is, uh, non-domestic rates, working in partnership with local authorities, and there's a council tax. Local authorities, of course, can range a whole host of, of charges um, that they may choose uh, to, to deploy, and many of them do, uh, charges for services and so on. But if the Parliament and the government, therefore, had uh, more levers of power right across the board, as we would have with independence, then again there's a further opportunity to look at, well, what further powers, financial powers, could local authorities have in that scenario? Uh, because we'd be fully responsible and accountable for the resources we raise and spend in Scotland, and that empowerment agenda could work for local authorities um, as well. So I, I won't have a list of what we would do for local government now in terms of that scenario, but that, that debate would be quite a, an empowering and, and an exciting one, um, as there is that, as I've described, a further transfer of powers from London to, to Edinburgh, what could go from Edinburgh to local councils? And that said, we may still have a proposition around uh, unitary setting of, of business rates uh, and so on. You may not choose to make everything local, uh, but some elements national, but the economic levers that local authorities could have, I think the prospects of them being enhanced are far better with independence than with the, the, the status quo or even the limited transfer of powers that I've, I've seen proposed to date. Thank you, Minister, for his responses. Thank you. Alec Rowley, please. Morning. Morning. Still morning. You, you mentioned islands when we talk about electoral turnout um, and Professor James Mitchell, when, when he gave evidence to this committee, he said it was notable that the island councils have consistently had turnouts that are among the highest. And it's also notable, I think, that the island councils, you will find less political party organisation in, in, in the island councils compared to the, the mainland councils. Um, Certainly that's the case I know in Shetland, which is the one I know best. But um, is it not just that when we look at party politics that the general public are sick to the teeth of politicians and party politicians and party political and, and and they actually end up at the end of the day thinking, um, you know, this lot are the same and we never actually get any place with them. It's even like a bit like the the, the pot calling the kettle black, that we're sitting here looking at local government and how they can increase their voter turnout, because Professor Mitchell also pointed out that across the UK there's been a steady decline in elections for all uh, levels of government. So, you know, is, is, is there something there about party politics more? And I know you've got a debate on this this afternoon. Minister? I think Mr Rowley uh, raises a, a very helpful um, uh, reflection upon... Uh, as all. And yes, there is a wider debate to be had about connecting and, and reconnecting it with our um, electorate. But of course, the phenomenon of, of decreasing turnout is Europe wide. And the last European elections showed a bit of a kind of anti establishment uh, point of view uh, coming uh, across in, in a European uh, context. The reference that's made to uh, the uh, island areas, of course, is an interesting one. I don't think it necessarily flaws that the best way to, to increase turnout in local authority elections is to scrap party politics, remove our parties from that. That would be very radical for, for Mr Rowley to suggest in the Labour Party, never mind more widely in Parliament. But there is something about uh, the politics on the islands, about how people engage with their uh, uh, local authorities and uh, turnout and the nature um, of their, their, their candidates. Um, um, and I think maybe in that sense, that de-party politicising their approach 
um, has helped them reach a consensual position to then negotiate with government what further powers could be proposed to take. That said, of course, the Western Isles is different from Orkney and Shetland in that it does have party politics in the council um, uh, authority uh, area uh, as well. And whilst independence may stand on in other parts um, of Scotland, it doesn't necessarily affect turnout. Looking at the turnout of just local authority elections, of course, there was a, a downward tra trajectory uh, until it was combined with the Scottish Parliament elections, uh, where it went from in the last sole local authority election, pre-Scottish Parliament election combined, was 44.9%, and then up to 58% for the first Scottish Parliament elections. Um, and then, of course, in 2012, when the council elections were again standalone, it was down to 39.7%, incidentally slight high, slightly higher than what some people uh, estimated. So that's not as healthy as we'd want it to be. I think we'll have more time to debate this in the uh, afternoon, and I have proposed and will work on a cross-party and quite consensual basis to take forward ideas for democratic participation uh, and turnout. So some of that's about how we vote. Should we consider telephone voting, electronic voting, online voting, and a sort of reference to debate in the House of Commons at potentially mobile phone uh, voting as well. So as technology moves on, I think we have to think about new ways of voting whilst absolutely reconnecting with our uh, electorate and understanding the reasons for lower, uh, lower turnout uh, as well. So I think it's a very complex uh, area, but we'll certainly learn from, from best practice where we find it whilst recognising this is a a phenomenon in, in developed countries and, and particularly in Europe um, as well. Interestingly, in Europe, the, um, the turnout tends to be higher, um, particularly in local elections, even though, even though I accept that it's been coming down. But, but generally, um, authorities, local authorities in Scotland are, are um, raising around 10%, just over 10% of the revenue. In Europe, that figure um, is average now about just over 40% of their revenue. And is there a correlation there, therefore, between, between people actually voting for, for a level of government where they actually do have um, powers to, to raise income and, 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 and are much more democratically accountable for that income? I mean, just briefly, I thought your answer on centralisation was spot on, and, and it's an honest answer, and it's... It's um, the, the difficulty between different levels of government and each having a mandate. But once we get past the referendum, regardless of the result, and it's certainly the view I would argue with the committee, is that we have to look at how local government is financed and, and do that across cross-party, because just now it becomes a party political issue and probably turns the people off even more just than before. So are you in favour of looking cross-party at actually how local government is financed and do you think there's a role for this committee post-referendum, regardless of the outcome, to actually look at that. In the spirit that Mr Rowley's made the suggestion, I think there's absolutely something in that ongoing uh, discussion about the powers and the financial freedoms of local authorities going forward. And that's why I think I tried to outline six principles we've used in engaging with the uh, island areas. We'd use the same principles to discuss it with cities or any other grouping of local authorities that might want to discuss the empowerment agenda and uh, post-referendum, because this place will be different, then there is space to have that discussion about, well, what does that mean for local government financial powers? And if we conduct it on the basis that Mr Rowley would like us to, on a consensual cross-party basis on what actually works, then I think that would be a very strong footing in which we could have that uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Rowley. Uh, Mark MacDonald, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, convener, we've spoken a little bit about turnout and... Um, participation and one of the concerns that's been raised with the committee during uh, during the process is that often when local authorities consult or governments consult they, they tend to go to a, a very restricted group of uh, individuals um, who, who tend to be the ones who are most involved in some of the consultation some of the um, discussions that take place and there are a large number of people out there who feel disenfranchised. Um, what steps can the Scottish Government take and, and maybe local authorities take to, to reach out more to those people who are not actively engaged to try and encourage them to be more engaged in what goes on at a local level? 
I think that's a, there's a great that's a great question. There's a lot in that, but we government we have to be very careful that we don't instruct some sort of new commandment. And this is how you must engage. This is how you must deliver participation. But I hope that the community empowerment bill helps deliver that culture of expectation around how we engage with our communities. Not by saying just how to do it better, because there are national standards, but actually empowering communities to let them have the say at the point they want to be involved, not uh, as Mr Macdonald quite rightly identifies at the end of a process and a predetermined outcome with a tick box mentality, but, but genuinely empowering them and having their say at the point at which it might matter more. So, so new rights in, in terms of that. Just by way of good practice and best practice, we're going to embark on uh, commissioning work with What Works Scotland around community plan partnerships and, and have an evidence-based approach around them to see what, what's making the biggest difference. And community-led projects are, are critical within that and engagement and involvement with communities. But some good practice would involve going beyond, if you'll forgive me for describing them as such, the usual suspects of those people who always attend the committee meetings and the same organisations, as brilliant as their work is, sometimes we have to go further than that to get wider opinion. So, for example, a, a community plan partnership I knew well when I chaired it in, in Renfrewshire, we went into children's homes to, to ask them what they thought about provisional services and so on, as well as the usual panels and meetings and thematic groups. So thinking about new ways of working, new ways of engagement a, is, is really good practice and we want to encourage that. Um, but not a top-down approach. Creating the conditions in which people become involved uh, uh, is, is, is certainly a, a direction that we would encourage. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we heard during our trip to Sweden uh, from Malmo was uh, around the, the sort of citizens jury or citizens panel that they have set up where people are uh, invited onto that, um, I'd say randomly, but there is a, a process to select people, but at the same time, it circumvents some of the groups, as you say, who are the ones who are most likely to be at the front of the queue to, to offer their opinions. Is that something the Scottish Government is keen to see happening? Yes, would encourage such good practice. Again, some authorities already do that, so it's to be encouraged and replicated uh, the, the, the country over because you can do it, of course, randomly through the electoral register or you know whatever other address list you choose to pick. But you could select uh, taxpayers, residents, voters, young people, whatever, and engage in different ways. So that customer panel idea has happened in a different way in Scotland, but, but absolutely the question is, would we encourage it? Uh, yes, we would. It's been deployed very effectively, because it does exactly as Mr Macdonald suggests. It brings different people into the fold. It's actually a two-way process. Not only does the public services learn from them, sometimes the members of the public, citizens who might not have known about the full array of public services or what's going on or indeed what the challenges are. That's shared as well and as they engage with each other you get the intergenerational benefit of young people finding out about what older people's issues are and vice versa. So that's very healthy and to be encouraged. One of the other issues that has come up is around um, size um, and the issue around remoteness of some communities from what they perceive to be the decision making that takes place. I mean, we took the, you could take it from the Western Isles perspective, for example, where it was mentioned that for people in Barra, Stornoway is as remote to them as Edinburgh is in, as a centre of decision making. Uh, if you look at Highland, for example, um, or Aberdeenshire, would people in Lawrence Kirk, for example, feel that they had a, a commonality with people in Fraserburgh, yet they are served by the same? Authority and one of the things that we we saw when we went to these uh, countries in Europe was that the size of municipalities um, it varies, um, and obviously there is in some places there's a difference uh, allowed for 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 example city authorities, but the unit size tends to be much smaller in terms of the the municipality or the authority. Has the Scottish government taken a view as to? looking in the future at how local government is operating in Scotland in terms of the size and number of authorities that we currently have. I know at the moment the, the position is that there would that the, there's no change foreseen, but is that something that could be looked at as part of a transfer of powers agenda in the future? I, I think that's a, a good question. And In all of the locations identified, I'm sure they'd agree that any location in Scotland feels closer than London in terms of transfer of powers and where uh, decisions uh, are made, but the principle of subsidiarity is to try and take decision making as close to the people uh, as possible, whilst addressing that issue of national delivery that I referenced earlier. On a specific point around uh, number of councils, structure of councils, 
and boundaries of councils, our position has not changed. And, and I'll say why in just a moment and bring in a, another argument along those lines. Is there is European evidence that I have seen that suggests more local authority elected members is the norm in Europe and, and may well uh, be of assistance. I just don't detect, I don't think that's where the Scottish public are right now, that more local authority councils in itself will deliver greater participation or improve services or anything else. So the instruction, the ministerial direction I've given the Boundary Commission is that at this point, um, there, there's no requirement for more councillors in Scotland to so work within the, the parameters at the moment. And they can, of course, explain the, the work they're undertaking at the moment in terms of uh, what that means for different numbers across Scotland. So same number of councillors or fewer as they propose at the moment, marginally. Um, but the reason we don't support um, a change to local authority boundaries, not just because it was the agreement in the Concordat in 2007, is because we think that that structural change would be a misuse of energy at this time because of the work that would involve. Of course, boundary changes may well end up in court as the final uh, resort where there, there's, there's not agreement on, on boundaries. And therefore, at this stage, we continue to hold to the structures we've got. And the challenge we've given to local authorities and community plan partnerships is to, to integrate, to work together, to work across boundaries, organisational, institutionally, and ge geographically as well, to, to focus on outcomes. And that is still the government's uh, uh, chosen approach at this time, to work across those boundaries. And for that reason, maintain the number of councillors, uh, the number of councils and the structures as they, or the boundaries as they stand. And I hope that, that answers the question. Thank you. Stuart McMillan, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Um, uh, kind of following on uh, from uh, Mark McDonald's question just regarding the, the, the number and the size uh, of authorities, um, have you, uh, are you aware of any particular uh, either positive or, or negative uh, evidence uh, where there, is, uh, there has been a, a co-terminosity uh, of boundaries between local government and likes of like, health boards and in other bodies in terms of the service provision? I'm thinking in terms of obviously Fife and the Western Isles. I've got the uh, similar, body, uh, similar uh, boundaries, certainly particularly for the, the health service and, uh, and the local authorities. I think Mr McMillan uh, quite rightly almost answers his own question there to say yes. Um, Fife is a good example. The island authorities are all good examples. Um, uh, the, the, there are others where co-terminosity, it does help. It, it does help when, in aligning uh, resources and having partnership approach because... You know, a chief executive from one organisation is talking to the chief executive of another organisation, or the same goes for chair and leader. So co-terminosity helps, but that said, um, it wouldn't be universally uh, beneficial because if you then transplanted that to every part of Scotland, well, you wouldn't just have a health board for Clackman and Shirsey because we know that the boundaries we have we've inherited in local authority structures from previous Conservative governments. It's not how you would design local authorities if you were to start from a blank page, but we are where we are, and I've explained why structural change and boundary change wouldn't be helpful, um, certainly at, at, at this time. So co-terminosity helps, but even where we don't have co-terminosity, the structures work where you've got the right partnership approach and people engage. So in other parts of the country where there's not co-terminosity, but there's good engagement, good partnership working, and then we've been able to make progress. And I'll give you one example, I suppose, um, yesterday, the National Community Planning Group heard from Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board and Glasgow City Council uh, on the approach that's been taken in community planning, and uh, it's uh, increasingly reassuring. So there's an example where you have six local authorities in a health board area, a large health board, making partnerships work across the different organisations but don't have absolute co-terminosity. So yes is the answer to the question. Where we've got it, it helps but you wouldn't make the structures fit just for the purpose or the objective of co-terminosity. Thank you for that. Um, certainly, earlier on in your, uh, your comments, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the words uh, differential devolution, uh, which uh, certainly I thought was a, an, a, an interesting uh, concept uh, to certainly put forward. Uh, and, the, and it struck me that the, with that particular, uh, with those comments, and also what, you've, uh, what you provided to the committee in the letter, uh, dated the 28th of March, when you, uh, at the bottom of page two, when you, uh, when, uh, when you suggest that, uh, uh, in terms of the, the service delivery and the paradox of local democracy and how it can actually be met, um, it just it struck me that, um, in terms of the, the local authorities, and we had evidence on this from Argyll and Butte Council in particular, um, just in terms of the, how they actually can deliver services 
at local level, particularly with uh, some authorities that are so uh, so widespread and so disparate. Uh, and it just it's uh, it just kind of struck me that kind of like, that going forward, irrespective of what happens with the referendum, but going forward, um, how do you how can you try to kind of square that circle in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, service delivery at local level is uh, is the best it possibly could be, uh, but at the same time uh, ensuring that there is a tremendous amount of local decision making actually taking place. Well, I was hoping the committee was going to give me the answer to all that, <laughs> <laughs> frankly. Uh, um, and you're the committee. Um, but um, I, I think this work will be informed by the Commission clearly looking at this paradox uh, w with their own point of view, uh, but with a range of experts and any evidence. Uh, the committee will look into it, uh, and the government, um, of, of course, we're very mindful of it. Um, some of it, some of it may well remain as a constant conflict. You, you can accept that there are national rights and service standards that we'd want to uh, deliver and deploy, but they might be applied differently locally. Because just as each authority will differ, so will communities within that authority, as Mr. McMillan's explained in our Gail and, and Butte context. So I think there'll be that ongoing uh, debate, and sometimes it'll be for political parties in their manifestos to produce the policy commitments they want to achieve. Sometimes it will be national and sometimes it will be left to local. But, um, you know, the charge of postcode lottery is sometimes unfair. So in, in, in some respects, you can't generalise about the public, but there'll have to be an acceptance. Do you want some things to be delivered nationally or do you want absolute local freedom? And if you want absolute local freedom, that will mean that something's different and in, in a different area. And will the public accept that? Well, I think they will in some areas. Uh, but not, not in everything. And that dialogue, that, that, that debate we can have about what those issues, what those policies and what those um, financial levers may be um, is, is certainly to come. But the, you know, the government's very open-minded to, uh, to the debate. But we, I think what I'm trying to indicate is some would make it as simple as localism and local is always best, always. Well, that's not the case if you want national standards on some areas. Now, that might be waiting times for a, you know, a, you know, a medical treatment and so on, just, just as an example, or, or certain rights around carers, for example. You know, people may want national rights, and therefore some issues will be national, for national determination, how they're applied locally, there can be flexibility around that. So it's a fair and honest debate to be had, and, we, and we'll certainly engage in it, but we don't have the um, overall answer, because, you know, of all the international comparisons you've looked at as well. I don't think it's fair to say that there is one structure, one system that's absolutely right for Scotland that we're not delivering. There's a range of options, there's a range of evidence and comparators, uh, but it's certainly about trying to make it as local as we can whilst um, ensuring there's national delivery. So hopefully that answers in part the question that's been posed, but I think it's an ongoing uh, debate. And uh, one final question is, it follows on uh, from that. Um, of, certainly throughout this particular inquiry and also in this morning we've heard the issue of, uh, of the focus upon cities and also upon rural communities. Um, but the, the, there's uh, also another part of, uh, of Scotland that's not really discussed a tremendous amount and that's the, the, the urban areas that are either uh, in between cities or, or basically wherever they are. Uh, and, uh, and for me, uh, I think that's very much a, an important part uh, of uh, certainly of Scotland that, uh, that that certainly needs to be pursued, and it's, it's uh, I certainly did raise this with the uh, deputy first deputy first minister on a previous committee, uh, looking at uh, the city strategy, uh, and so in, in terms of the with the work that uh, that you're undertaking, minister, um, how do you see the the issue of the uh, of the the, the non city urban areas actually uh, having uh, powers uh, and and actually having the the ability to uh, to fully uh, develop um, their areas as compared to um, as compared to trying to be compared to uh, other parts of Scotland, such as the cities and the rural areas. I think that's right in the sense that towns must not be forgotten in the, in the whole debate and the whole mix about uh, uh, devolution, empowerment, and subsidiarity. But, but more reassuringly, um, towns are very much the foremost. Uh, kind of central to our thinking because the Islands areas almost a year ago launched their campaign and over that period we've been engaging with them. The Cities Alliance 
I think, is working well, pulling Scotland cities together to collaborate where they have strength. But so too are the towns, but you don't hear about it. You know, the towns have, have uh, particularly around the town centres uh, issue, been organising themselves through a range of fora to take forward their agenda. But I suppose this is a reflection on local authorities themselves. Most local authorities are a mixture of cities, towns and rural areas or islands, you know, where that's appropriate. So where authorities want to approach us on that collaborative uh, basis, then we'll certainly um, engage with them. But the policy environment we've created and the resource environment that I think we've created is, is just as supportive of towns. Now, in the Community Empowerment Bill that I've spoken about quite a lot this morning, um, I've covered um, different elements. One of the key elements will be extending the community right to buy from rural areas to urban areas for the first time. Um, so... There is great work going on in relation to our towns, but it sometimes doesn't get the focus it maybe uh, deserves. Now, Minister, with lead responsibility for delivering the government's town centre action plan, I do what I can to promote that work, and you know we, we need to, to, to raise the profile of this agenda as well. But to say more, more crucially, it's, it is a reflection of the fact that local authorities, the way they're made up, may represent cities, towns, and uh, and rural areas. But I can assure you, the government's. Um, on top of all of these agendas to ensure that no part of Scotland is left out uh, in our actions and our considerations as this constitutional journey, very exciting constitutional journey, goes forward. Are there from Alex Rowley, please. Thanks, Convener. Just, just on that point, I mean, you mentioned the cities, and, and but the city regions are absolutely crucial, I would suggest, and, and do you agree with that? And, and the role of, obviously, economic development and local government is is crucial for, for regenerating Scotland, and that needs to be done on a city-region basis as well as a smaller basis. Can I thank Mr Rowley for answering the question even better that, than I did to Mr McMillan? I think, that, I think that's right, because the, the course of city-region may be based around the city, but it's the towns and other communities that make up that, that, that district or that conurbation that is the city-region. Uh, yes, I do agree that those... Um, those alliances are, are making a, a difference and have great power to, to be the dynamos of economic growth, absolutely. And we should continue to innovate with them on what measures can further enhance the prospects in those areas, not just to deliver economic growth, but to tackle inequality in those areas as well, geographic and individual. Thank you. Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, Convener. Um, good afternoon, Minister. Um, the committee, we did hear from local gover government minority leaders um, on the types of financial autonomy that they would like to see, and Edinburgh in particular had mentioned about um, hotel bed tax. Can I ask, firstly, his view on that? The, uh, this, is, this is a matter that I think has come before, come to um, the Tourism Minister Fergus Ewing's uh, attention. The Scottish Government's not particularly supportive of that new tax. We don't see what value it adds uh, to, to tourism. We think it might be counterproductive. My last recollection of this issue was the Council discussed it in 2012 and they themselves opted not to pro progress the, the bed, not to be confused with the bedroom tax, but a kind of hotel bed or the hotel room tax, whatever it was proposed at the time. So even they, can, they uh, determined not to, uh, not to proceed with it, I think, in, in 2012, fairly fairly recently and look at other options and that includes engaging with, with the government and we're happy to continue to engage with them. I think it's just an example, if I went back to the, the principles, one of which can uh, command or show public support and I'm not entirely sure that the City of Edinburgh could evidence great support for this uh, hotel bed tax but as I say the council opted not to progress it themselves and I don't think Fergus Ewing, as the appropriate minister, was particularly keen either. That said, local authorities have a range of powers and uh, financial mechanisms to deploy to, to continue to raise income. Yeah, um, another funding question, Minister. Um, how well the current distribution formula operates and his view and your view on the current difficulties and issues with the formula? Minister. I have the privileged position of when I was in COSLA as a group leader and a council leader, I was part of the last uh, very intense distribution formula task force and the prospect of getting 32 out of 32 council leaders to agree the formula that pleases them all is zero. So we have to arrive at the best formula we can. 
essentially we have uh, inherited a formula, tried to augment it and improve it in partnership with local authorities uh, through COSLA. Uh, that's what we uh, elected to do. That's what we have done. Uh, we listened to COSLA's view recently on, on some of the issues around whether to follow the needs-based approach uh, or not. COSLA's arrived at a decision. Scottish Government accepts, understands uh, is delivering that decision. So we've tried to work in partnership throughout. But local government finances is a tough issue in that each local authority will always argue for uh, the best deal they can possibly get in a formula that suits their needs. And, and therefore, um, it remains a, a partnership approach that we will take. But we think you know, the formula does recognise need. Um, and therefore, I do believe it's fit for purpose. Although, if there's any suggestions for improvement, then we'll, we'll happily look at them. Um, the final point I'd want to make around local government finance um, is that um, how you share the cake is one issue. But it's very important to remember that the government has protected local government bid budgets as best we can. Not every local authority leader might think that, but the comparisons with our counterparts show that we have protected local authorities. We protected health, first and foremost. And we have then tried to protect local authorities as the overall reduction to Scottish Government's budget took place. Then we have protected uh, local authorities. Now, I wouldn't, don't, uh, don't just take my uh, word for it. I would uh, reference uh, Sir Merrick Cockle, a Conservative councillor, the, the chairman of the LGA in, in England, who said, every year I meet my opposite numbers in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and they listen to us in wide-eyed disbelief at the budget cuts we're enduring, and they are not. So I would refer to Councillor Sir Merrick Cockle, Chairman of the LGA, who just shows that we've, we've done our best to protect uh, Scottish local authority budgets in very difficult circumstances. Briefly, please, Anne. Just, yeah, just a final point. Um, just to ask when the, the bill, the Community Impairment Bill, will be laid in the Parliament. Uh, the... I think I'll have civil servants kind of kick me underneath the table to say I'm not sure if you can see. Of course, I can share anything with Committee of Parliament. Um, a, the bill will be launched imminently. I'm you a, a wee supplementary. Just more supplementary. Abroad, and particularly in Sweden and Paris, they, have, they don't have a bed tax. They have what's called a city tax, just for the cities, which sort of worked quite well. And I just wonder what your opinion was on that. I could put it in writing. But most of the cities have it, not the rural areas and not places that are deprived. Rather than call it a bed tax, could it be a city tax? Edinburgh could probably support it, so could probably Glasgow, but I don't know about the rest. What would be your opinion on that? Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure if uh, Mr Buchanan will forgive me, if I go back to the Ministerial Tower and tell Mr Swinney I've just committed to, to a city tax, I may not be lasting much longer on the Ministerial Tower. So I'm more than happy to receive correspondence and ensure that the government gives it full consideration. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Just one final question, Minister. The issue of COSLA negotiations in terms of budgets, given the discussions that are currently taking place in COSLA and the proposed split from COSLA by a number of authorities, how will that impact on future negotiations in terms of budget settlements? Minister. Um, of course, it's entirely a matter for COSLA how they conduct their business and how members choose to... Uh, participate and uh, I'm aware of the issues that, that, that got COSLA to this uh, position. One of them is distribution and, and they've now determined and concluded their position and, and that's helpful in that respect. Uh, in terms of a hypothetical of other local authorities departing from uh, COSLA, the position of the government is as I outlined it at the COSLA conference this year which is that for major financial or policy matters, you would expect, would you not, that we engage with COSLA first and foremost, but of course we would dialogue, have dialogue with, with other local authorities. Um, but as the collective uh, body, the umbrella group for Scotland local authorities, we would engage first and foremost with COSLA, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't kind of block out any other local authority. But substantive discussions, it would be best to have with that uh, umbrella uh, organisation, particularly on those national significant policy and financial matters. Thank you. Uh, final question, Minister, and you'll be pleased to hear it's not about the distribution formula, because you and I have had our debates about that previously in different lives. Um, the only part of local government that hasn't changed since 1974 is community councils. Um, does the government have uh, any uh, thinking on the future of community councils? And do you think that community councils 
um, get the respect uh, that they should um, from local authorities themselves? Well, convener, I started out as a community councillor at 18 years old. I suspect I'm the exception, not the norm, um, in, in community council membership. So the government does support community councils. We uh, have undertaken the, the, the Short Life Working Group and a, a range of actions to uh, support them, including some recent pilot work and work with the Improvement Service. So as I said earlier, I don't propose a wholesale review of their uh, functions, because I think that gets us back to structural debate issues when community councils, like a range of other community anchor organisations, can deliver projects, can take advantage of the Community Empowerment Bill and other um, government funding streams as well to make things happen locally. But I think they should get more respect. I think they should have more engagement uh, from some uh, to ensure that their statutory place is, is actually um, recognised, because they do have a role for example, in the, in the planning process, and, and that should be remembered uh, and recognised. But I do want to send out a message to, to all Scotland's community anchor organisations that they'll all have a really significant role to play going forward in the delivery of the empowerment agenda, because just as we want to empower our nation with independence, we want to empower our communities as well. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I suspend for uh, a few minutes for a change of witnesses. Thank you very much. Um, our next item of business is to undertake stage two consideration of the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill. 
I'd like to welcome Dennis Robertson, the member in charge of the bill, Stuart Stevenson, who has been designated as, uh, as a member in charge of the bill for the purposes of stage two, uh, and Keith Brown, Minister for Transport and Veterans, who has portfolio responsibility for the subject matter of the bill. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the marshalled list of amendments uh, and the groupings of amendments. Um, I would remind members uh, of our stage one report on the bill <coughs> in relation to the subject matter of the amendments before us to today. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in each group to speak to and move their amendment and to speak to all the other amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate to me if they wish to speak. If Mr Robertson wishes to contribute to the general debate in a group of amendments, he should also indicate this to me. Uh, if they have not already spoken in the group, I will invite the Minister and then Mr Stevenson as a designated member in charge to contribute to the debate. The debate in each group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the First Amendment in the group to wind up. I will then ask whether the member who, is, who moved the First Amendment wishes to press the amendment to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on the amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If any committee member objects, the committee must immediately move to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when I call it, they should say not moved. Please remember that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only MSPs are allowed to participate in the debates on amendments and committee members are allowed to vote at stage two. Voting is by a show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. I will also put a question on each section at the appropriate point. Uh, before I move on to the amendments, do any of the panel have any general remarks they would like to make? Mr Robertson. Hey, thank you, Convener. Uh, can I begin by thanking the committee um, for their consideration at Stage 1 and obviously for the members who took part in the Stage 1 debate and for agreeing the general principles uh, of the Disabled Persons Parking Bill Scotland. I can also take this opportunity to thank the Minister for uh, supporting uh, this bill and for also um, answering many of the questions that were asked uh, during the uh, debate on the 20th of May. Convener, this is a small bill, um, but I think the bill in itself is looking at the enforcement aspects of the blue badge in terms of misuse. I think the bill is uh, proportionate and appropriate um, uh, as it stands, uh, and therefore uh, I'd be hoping that members would accept the bill as is. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Robertson. Um, I will move on, and the first uh, item that we have to deal with are sections 1 and 2. Uh, the question is that sections 1 and 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, section 3 is limitation on power to confiscate badge. Can I call Amendment 1 in the name of John Wilson in a group on its own? Um, Mr Wilson, would you like to move and speak to your amendment? Please? Thank you, Convener. Uh, just to make clear to the committee, these amendments have been suggested by Inclusion Scotland. I know the committee took evidence uh, from Inclusion Scotland uh, during the passage of the Stage 1 of the Bill. However, they feel it's still necessary to raise... Uh, these amendments uh, just to highlight some of the issues of concern. Amendment 1, uh, the, it's been quite clear there is no uh, issue or objection to the confiscation of uh, blue badges uh, that have been cancelled or otherwise been made invalid. However, there's concerns that confiscation of valid badges may have serious consequences for a disabled person impacting on their right to independent living. I'd like to see the section amended to restrict the power to confiscate badges or to cancel invalid or fraudulent badges. Confiscation of a valid badge effectively imposes a penalty without the right of appeal. The appropriate penalty is a fixed penalty notice for the parking offence, which can be appealed, or in the case of systematic or repeated abuse, prosecution through the courts. 
purpose of Amendment 1 is to limit the powers of confiscation to blue badges that are not valid, e.g. because they have been cancelled, because they should not have been returned to the or they should have been returned to the issuing authority, because they have been tampered with or because they are fake forged. It should be possible for enforcement officers to quickly establish if a badge is invalid by checking the serial number against the national database. Where a valid badge has allegedly been misused, it should not be assumed that this misuse will continue or that the badge will not be returned to the badge holder by the person who allegedly misused it. Guidance can be established in a process for informing the badge holder of the alleged misuse, requiring the badge holder to confirm that the badge has been returned to them and warning that the future misuse may lead to the badge being withdrawn. Thank you. Does any member wish to contribute to the debate? Uh, in which case, uh, Minister, please. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I would just say that third party misuse of blue badges is uh, certainly a problem. I've had correspondence on it uh, from constituents and also from the wider public during the course of this uh, bill. The provisions in the bill, as currently constituted, would allow confiscation of a badge from third parties who have no entitlement to use that badge. And that's very important because it sends out the message that blue badge misuse is socially unacceptable. Uh, the provision to confiscate badges that are being misused is intended to discourage and prevent abuse of the system. Uh, and removing this provision, in my view, would weaken enforcement of the blue badge scheme. And just to be clear, the end result of uh, confiscating badges from third parties is that valuable parking spaces will be freed up for use by blue badge holders who need these spaces the most. So for those reasons, convener, I support the provision in Dennis Robertson's bill. Thank you, Minister. I'm going to take Mr Stevenson as the designated member in charge, and then I'm going to take Mr Robertson after that. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Convener. Amendment 1 seeks to remove the power of a constable or enforcement officer in Scotland to confiscate a badge which has been issued under Section 21 of the chronically sick and disabled person Scotland Act 1970, but is not being displayed on the vehicle as prescribed by the regulations of the scheme. I'm concerned that the amendment would weaken the powers of local authorities to confiscate badges. It would mean that confiscation would be limited to badges which have been cancelled, for example, because they've been reported lost or stolen, or should have been returned to the local authority under the requirements of the regulation, for example, if the badge holder was deceased. Significantly, Amendment 1 would remove the power for constables or local authorities to confiscate a valid badge from a third party who has no right to use that badge. The third party might be a friend or relative of a badge holder who is using the badge for their own benefit to gain free parking. It might also be an individual who has stolen the blue badge. To remove the power to confiscate in these circumstances would mean that that abuse by the third party could continue unhindered. This not only disadvantages the person to whom the badge was issued, but the many other disabled people, and there are 263,045 blue badge holders as of the 31st of March 2012, who would be deprived of parking in disabled bays and of the independence that this provides. Concerns have been raised during the passage of the bill that confiscation would deprive badge holders of their freedom. I want to reassure members that blue badges will only be confiscated when there is a justification to do so. It's been made clear that when a valid badge is confiscated from a third party, it will be returned to the badge holder. This will be accompanied by a letter reminding them of their rights and responsibilities under the blue badge scheme. This protects badge holders, whether it is from inadvertent or unscrupulous misuse. Regulations will require local authorities to return the badge as soon as practical, and in any event, no later than 14 days after confiscation. Local authorities uh, have told us that they have no reason to hold on to badges, and as happens currently, every effort will be made to return the badge to the holder quickly. The power to confiscate is intended to protect badge holders, raise awareness of the value of the blue badge, and reduce the propensity for future misuse. We need to get to the stage where blue badge misuse is seen by all as socially unacceptable. I therefore invite John Wilson to seek the committee's agreement uh, to withdraw Amendment 1. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. Mr Robertson, please. Uh, very briefly, Convener, I, I think the point has been uh, uh, well, uh, well um, 
verbalised by Stuart Stevenson here, and that we, we are trying to get the, the badges that are being misused uh, off the streets because it does disadvantage uh, people uh, with, uh, who are blue badge holders themselves. If someone is acting, uh, have a, has a badge and there's a third party misuse, they are denying someone else uh, a parking space. And to say that the consequences um, for the disabled person is, uh, I think, with, with, with reference to the amendment, you know, there's serious consequences. Well, the serious consequences is actually the misuse of others. It's not the confiscation. And the confiscation will be done uh, only when there is justifiable reasons for actually removing the badge. Um, and I think it's actually the justifiable reasons that we need to actually uh, focus on, convener. Badges will not be removed if it's felt that there's some degree of ambiguity, uh, but it will, it will be removed and confiscated if it is absolutely certain by the, the officer removing the badge that it is being misused and returned to the badge holder with a, an explanatory letter. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Mr Robertson. Uh, can I ask John Wilson to wind up and press or withdraw, please? Convener, just in responding to the comments, I welcome the statement by Mr Stevenson uh, in relation to the blue badge being returned to the rightful owner if it is a legitimate blue badge. Uh, and based on those assurances, I will not proceed with moving this amendment. Uh, it's withdrawn. withdrawn. Uh, are the committee happy that that's withdrawn? Yes. Thank you. Um, in which case, we move on um, to Section 3. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, can I now move on to Amendment 2? Can I call that amendment in the name of John Wilson, grouped with Amendments 3 and 4? Uh, Mr Wilson, to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Inclusion Scotland and other organisations representing disabled people have expressed concerns that a disabled person or a carer may be criminalised where they have inadvertently used a blue badge that has been cancelled. For example, if it had been reported lost but subsequently been found before the replacement had been received. It is appreciated that Section 4 amends UK legislation to bring Scotland into line with amendments made in England and Wales in 2013 but we would like to see the bill amended to delete this section uh, as the Law Society has indicated that it is not necessary. If the committee is not minded to delete the entire section, we would like to see section 4 amended to prevent people being criminalised for inadvertently using a badge that is not valid. For example, a carer who did not know the badge had been reported lost or stolen or a badge that had been reported lost but was then found. Amendment 3 deletes section, subsection 2, which amends section 117 of the Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984, as the 1984 Act already refers to section 21 of the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970. Subsection 2 appears to add an unnecessary additional reference. Thank you. Um, anyone else wish to enter the debate? Okay. Uh, maybe in your summing up, Mr Wilson, you could tell us uh, what other organisations um, have uh, backed Inclusion Scotland, because you said Inclusion Scotland and other organisations. Um, Minister? Uh, thanks, Convener. Very briefly, uh, I don't support uh, these amendments. Uh, in my view, there has to be adequate redress uh, for those who use cancelled badges or use badges which should have been returned under the regulations. This is part, if you like, of the the teeth of the bill. Uh, that doesn't mean to say, of course, that the circumstances of each case will not be considered closely. Uh, and Dennis Robertson has taken steps to ensure that the guidance highlights that care needs to be taken by enforcement officers uh, in identifying the circumstances under which badges are used. And that includes the use of cancelled badges or those which should have been returned. But as with the previous amendment, removing powers to take action against those who deliberately misuse the badge will not, in my view, reduce or encourage the reduction of deliberate misuse. Thank you. Stevenson, please. Thank you, Kamira. Amendment 2 provides that a person would only be guilty of an offence under Section 21.4bza of the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act of 1970 if that person had cause to know that they were using a castle badge or a badge which should have been returned to the issuing authority under the regulations. This would mean that an element of knowledge would need to be proved by the prosecutor. I oppose the amendment as it introduces an unnecessary complication and would make it very difficult to obtain convictions against those abusing the scheme. 
This is an area where it would be exceedingly difficult to frame an offence so as to leave reasonable prospect to convicting those who should be convicted, while ruling out completely the possibility of action against an innocent party who uses a cancelled badge through inadvertence. As the law stands at present, each case has to be treated on its own merits. Not all cases will be considered appropriate for report to the Procurator Fiscal. In cases where cases are reported by the police or local authority, the Procurator Fiscal will decide what action to take, including whether it is in the public interest to prosecute someone. I want to put on the record that we would not expect action to be taken if a person has previously reported their badge lost, finds it, and inadvertently uses it again instead of the replacement badge. The same situation would apply to a carer who transports a badge holder and is unlikely to be aware that the badge holder is using a cancelled badge. These examples are specifically identified in the guidance being developed by the multi-agency working group, which I understand includes Inclusion Scotland, um, to support the bill, which also highlights the need for a pragmatic approach. Turning to Amendment 3, this seeks to remove from the bill subsection 2 of section 4, which amends section 117 of the Road Traffic Act 1984, so as to make it an offence to display on a parked vehicle a badge which has been cancelled or should have been returned to the issuing authority under the regulations. I oppose this amendment for exactly the same reasons as I opposed Amendment 2. Turning to Amendment 4, this would remove Section 4 of the Bill entirely, meaning that neither Section 21 of the 1970 Act nor Section 117 of the 1984 Act would provide for the use of a cancelled badge or badge which should have returned under the regulations to be in advance. Section 2 of the Bill gives local authorities the statutory power to cancel badges which are reported as lost or stolen or should have been returned under the regulations. If these badges are subsequently found to be in use, particularly by a person to whom the badge was not issued, it would seem logical that that misuse should constitute an offence. I therefore ask the member to seek the committee's agreement to withdraw Amendment 2 and ask that he not move Amendments 3 and 4. Convener. Thank you. Mr Robertson, please. Uh, very little to say, convener, uh, in respect of this. Um, I, I think it's, uh, for me, uh, if a badge has actually been, for instance, lost and is then found but another badge has been issued, um, there, there could be a, a mix-up to some extent, and that will be taken into account. Everything is going to be proportionate, uh, convener, and the guidance will be able to illustrate that, um, I, I believe. I think what we need to do here is to try and uh, um, be sure that any badge which has been uh, reported lost uh, doesn't find its way out into the wider general public for use. And if that badge is then found by uh, an officer to being used, then it should be confiscated and the person prosecuted. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr Robertson. Can I call John Wilson to wind up an Amendment 2 and press for withdrawal? Convener, to respond to your initial question, as you'll be aware, Inclusion Scotland is a national network of di disabled people's organisations and individual disabled people. I don't have specific uh, individual organisations to hand that I could actually name uh, in relation to your question. Uh, in relation to the responses received from the Minister and Mr Stevenson in relation to the amendments, can I say that uh, I'm minded to accept Mr Stevenson's comments regarding the, that not every case that would be identified would be subject to prosecution and that there would be uh, discretion uh, within the system to allow whether or not cases are reported to Procurator Fiscal and that the public interest test is applied to ensure that we do not see unnecessary prosecution of individuals who inadvertently uh, fall foul of the legislation without knowledge of doing so. So I withdraw. Uh, are committee happy for that withdrawal? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, if we can move on. And I call Amendment 3 in the name of John Wilson, already debated with Amendment 2. Uh, Mr Wilson, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Um, if I can move on, because I see no objection there, can I call Amendment 4 in the name of John Wilson, already debated with Amendment 2. Mr Wilson, to move or not move? Not moved. 
Thank you. Um, fine, we can move on then. Uh, uh, we now have to uh, agree. Um, s oh, sorry, I've lost it. Uh, can I put the question on section four of the bill? Uh, are we all agreed on section four? Thank you. Um, if I can now call Amendment 5 in the name of John Wilson, grouped with Amendment 6, uh, can I ask Mr Wilson to move Amendment 5 and speak to both amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. Concern still remains uh, about the use of non-uniformed enforcement officers for the inspection and confiscation of badges. Uh, there is no objection to non-uniformed officers undertaking surveillance and for checking displayed badges on parked vehicles. But for the reasons outlined uh, previously, we believe that only uniformed officers should have the power to require a badge to be produced or confiscate badges. The key in this is the enforcement officers must be unambiguously identifiable uh, to prevent fraud or abuse of vulnerable people. Amendment 6 removes the provision allowing the appointment of non-uniformed enforcement officers. It would not prevent local authorities from continuing to employ non-uniformed officers to carry out investigation activities such as surveillance and checking the validity of displayed badges against the national based database. Amendment 5 is consequential. Thank you. Mr Buchanan, please. Um, thank you very much indeed. I think this is, uh, should be, uh, is, is not right. I think if you have a non-uniformed officer, it doesn't really matter. As long as they've got the right ID and they can be seen, it should be OK. I just think to waste police time on getting somebody, a uniformed officer, to, because a non-uniformed officer is, or non-uniformed person has seen a badge, they call for the police, it takes time, by that time they've moved away. I do not see the problem particularly. I don't think it was, it was mooted that it's, people would be upset, if, particularly if they're disabled, that somebody is not in uniform. Surely if they throw a, show a valid badge, they would not be upset, and therefore I think that they should, I think we should definitely allow non-uniformed officers to have the power to uh, confiscate the badge. It's got to be seen, I think, as a criminal offence. Thank you. Any other members wish to enter the debate? Minister, please. Can I say, can we, I would agree with the points made by uh, Mr Buchanan. And the other point to make as well is that cases of suspected fraud or persistent misuse of a blue badge often would need uh, longer term surveillance and investigation than is able to be carried out by a parking attendant in the course of their day to day duties. Uh, authorities choosing to employ, and authorities will have the right to choose or otherwise, uh, to employ an enforcement officer who may or may not be in uniform. We'll be able to take, in our view, a more proactive approach to tackle blue badge misuse through investigations and targeted surveillance, which could result in the confiscation of the badge. And I think this is a, a pragmatic response to tackling blue badge misuse and blue badge holders. I think that was the intent behind Dennis Robertson, including this. Um, specifically where blue badge holders are, are using their badges in compliance with the scheme, they will have absolutely nothing to fear from this. And it would not be good use, incidentally, of a local authority's scarce resources to use such officers to approach blue badge uh, holders indiscriminately uh, on the street, as has been suggested. When carrying out their duties, the enforcement officers need not be in uniform, but as suggested by Mr Buchanan, they will be required to carry appropriate ID and authorisation. So for those reasons, I support the provision in Dennis Robertson's bill that local authorities should have the power to appoint non-uniform staff to investigate abuse of the blue badge scheme and to inspect and confiscate badges where that's appropriate. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. <coughs> Amendment 6 seeks to delete the provision of the bill which provides a power for local authorities to appoint a new class of officer to enforce the Blue Badge Scheme and who may or may not operate in uniform. Amendment 5 is consequential to Amendment 6, so if the new class of enforcement officer cannot be used by a local authority, there is no need for the provision in Section 5, brackets 3 of the Bill, which provides for it not to be an offence to refuse examination of a badge if the enforcement officer does not produce evidence of their authority. <clears throat> I oppose Amendments 5 and 6 because they would restrict the powers of local authorities to take a proactive approach to blue badge misuse. Cases of systematic fraud or misuse cannot always be dealt with at the time by parking attendants who have wider duties to carry out. Such cases may need longer term surveillance and investigation. Additionally, when the public report cases of suspected fraud or persistent misuse of a blue badge to the local authority, they quite rightly expect that their concerns will be taken seriously and fully investigated. 
Local authorities choosing to employ an enforcement officer will be able to take a more proactive approach to tackle blue badge misuse. As the Minister said, parking attendants with a wider responsibilities will not always be able to follow up such cases as longer term and surveillance investigation may be required to establish a pattern of misuse over time and gather supporting evidence. Of course, some areas of the country may not experience the same level of blue badge abuse, particularly if parking is free. Remembering that misuse and more seriously abuse of blue badges can lead to the over a quarter of a million with a genuine need being deprived of access to their parking places. It should be understood that gathering information and evidence is going to be a necessary part of tackling this issue. Having the option to deploy plainclothes staff to undertake enforcement duties is necessary, as with plainclothes police, to support surveillance activities and protect those staff in what may be challenging circumstances. Where local authorities have particular challenges, this option can increase effectiveness and improve outcomes for badge holders. Like all enforcement staff, those carrying out their duties in plain clothes have a requirement to carry appropriate identification and authorization, in particular when they approach members of the public. In this respect, they are like any other public official. There is no more potential for fraudulent impersonation of such staff than is the case for other authority holders. I therefore request uh, John Wilson to seek the committee's approval to withdraw Amendment 5 and ask him not to move Amendment 6. Mr Robertson, please. Uh, very briefly, convener, can I just say that I concur with uh, Cameron Buchanan's uh, statement? Uh, and I think that uh, a person who is a, a valid badge holder has nothing to fear at any time in producing that badge, whether the uh, official is in uniform or not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Robertson. Mr Wilson, to wind up and press or withdraw, please. Convener, I welcome the assurances that have been received from the Minister and Mr Stevenson in relation to, particularly in relation to the ID. Uh, that will be issued to any officer appointed by the Council to carry out enforcement on behalf of the Council. Uh, while I do not intend to uh, proceed with moving this motion, uh, it would be interesting just to, and for future discussion and future consideration uh, that both the member in charge of the bill and the Minister consider look at discussions with local authorities to ensure that we have a standardised ID card that's issued uh, so that disabled blue badge holders who use different local authorities are assured that there will be a standardisation in terms of the, the, the style uh, of the identification used so there is no confusion about what's happening when they go travel from one local authority to another. So that's a withdrawal. withdrawal. Are the committee con content with that withdrawal? Thank you. Um, uh, we now move on to uh, Amendment 6, and I call that amendment in the name of John Wilson, already debated with Amendment 5. Mr Wilson, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Um, in which case, I now move on to Amendment number 7 in the name of John Wilson. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. The question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Uh, the question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And now I move on to Amendment 7 in the name of John Wilson and the group on its own. Mr Wilson, to move and speak to the amendment, please. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> As has already been stated by Mr Stevenson, uh, Inclusion Scotland are members of the Blue Badge Enforcement Working Group and welcome the progress that the group is making on developing a code of practice guidance that takes account of many of the concerns that have been raised. The guidance will cover, for example, circumstances in which a badge can be confiscated procedure for return of a confiscated badge and identification of enforcement officers. It would be helpful if the bill was amended to give statutory backing to this guidance. Therefore, Amendment 7 seeks to give powers to Scottish ministers to issue guidance and requires authorities to have regard to that guidance. I move. Okay. Do any members wish to enter the debate? No. Minister, please. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 7, as referred, seeks to ensure that Scottish Ministers may issue guidance on the implementation of the provisions in this Bill and that local authorities must have regard to that guidance. In other words, it seeks to provide statutory underpinning for any guidance which is issued. 
Uh, the committee, though, I think, is aware from previous discussions that two multi-agency working groups are developing good practice guidance on this bill, which will be issued in turn to local authorities and to the police. However, I don't think that statutory underpinning of the guidance is required, and I'd want to assure members that in the case of areas covered by the bill which will require specific detailed provisions to be complied with, these will be set down in the regulations. For example, the timescales for return of valid badges to a badge holder will be contained in regulations, as will the requirement on an individual to specify the grounds for requesting a review of a local authority decision to refuse a badge. Uh, the policy memorandum and the delegated powers memorandum on the bill set out the basis on which certain matters were to be covered by the regulations, and the delegated powers committee has not raised any concerns about the general approach on delegated powers. Uh, guidance is just that. It should provide good practice advice on administering and enforcing the blue badge scheme, which local authorities can adopt to suit local circumstances. It has been and will continue to be practice for the Scottish Government to update the guidance on the operation of the scheme. Any significant changes are made through consultation with a working group, and it's important that the guidance can be used flexibly by local authorities in order to fit with local arrangements. And for those reasons, convener, I don't see the need to provide statutory underpinning for any guidance issued in relation to this bill, and I would ask John Wilson to withdraw Amendment 7. Thank you, Minister. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, Amendment 7 seeks to provide statutory underpinning for any guidance issued in respect to the provisions of the bill. I entirely agree with uh, the views of Keith Brown, Minister for Transport and Veterans, on this issue. Guidance is under development, and the important thing is that the areas where there is a need to comply with specific regulations, these will be prescribed in the regulations which will support the bill. Uh, the amendment at subsection 2 states local authorities must have regard to any guidance issue. And Mr Wilson uh, helpfully in his remarks said that the, it requires authorities, it, it, the authorities require to have regard to any guidance. Um, the phrasing used carries with it the danger of converting a power that any local authority may use into one that they must use. Uh, I therefore, for that reason and all the other reasons expressed, would ask John Wilson to seek the committee's permission uh, to withdraw his amendment. Thank you. Mr Robertson, please. Uh, again, very briefly, Convener. Um, the, the Minister made reference to the two multipurpose working groups. Uh, I attend these uh, groups, as does Inclusion Scotland. Um, during our meetings, um, uh, we have worked very closely with Inclusion Scotland and other members. And Inclusion Scotland at these meetings have welcomed the tone of the guidance actually being developed uh, at these meetings. Um, I, I believe that the guidance in itself uh, and the, we took on the comments from stage one uh, from this committee uh, in terms of we will ensure that the guidance is appropriate and we will ensure that the appropriate guidance has the top maybe ten uh, aspects uh, for the blue badge holders at any given time. The, the, I think it was Mr Buchanan uh, at the stage one had made reference to the guidance uh, that's issued in the leaflets, etc., a uh, convener uh, being basically far too large and very complex in terms of uh, uh, how it was set out. So we are working very hard uh, with the multipurpose groups to ensure that the guidance will be uh, in a format uh, that is appropriate uh, for the, the badge holder to understand. And again, as I say, I believe that the guidance is, is, being, is being taken forward with the, with the groups, and that includes Inclusion Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Wilson, to wind up and press or withdraw, please. Thank you, Convener. And winding up, and uh, take cognizance of the comments made by the Minister uh, and Mr Stevenson, including the member uh, in charge of the bill, Mr Robertson, in relation to the issue in terms of the ongoing work being carried out by the Blue Badges Enforcement Working Group and the other working group to ensure that guidance can be developed that basically is workable and with the consent of the organisations who rely on the Blue Badge Scheme for their members and the individuals involved. Therefore, I, I will not be moving my amendment. Thank you. Are the committee content that that's withdrawn? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in that qu case, we move on. The question is that sections 7 and 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Uh, the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Uh, 
that uh, concludes the stage two proceedings on this bill. Uh, the Parliament has not yet determined the date when stage three proceedings will take place, but members can now lodge stage three amendments at any time with the legislation team. I wish to thank Dennis Robertson, Stuart Stevenson and the Minister for Transport and Veterans Affairs for attending this morning, uh, and I thank members for their participation today. Can we agree to uh, defer item three in our agenda until next week? Yes. Thank you very much, in which case I close the committee. Thank you. Thank you.